So we might be in trouble today. Because we're always told in seminary that when we preach, our job is to always make sure that we preach good news. Well, the good news, which sometimes might not always sound like good news. So you have on the front cover of the bulletin a tree, dead, stump, lifeless. We have passages this morning that talk about tribulation and suffering. And a quote in the bulletin that says, nothing shapes our soul like failure. So we'll see how well that goes this morning by the time we walk out, how uplifted we might be. I like that quote, nothing shapes the soul like failure. You can find that tucked in the back. We need to admit that character building is not easy and that we will lapse often and never truly arrive. Some failures wound and scar us, but by God's grace, they can also make us stronger and help us to grow in virtues like humility and compassion. Now, when we start talking about Paul, in some way, we begin, what it sounds like is glorifying suffering. The, the New King James Version uses the word tribulation, which actually gets at the meaning better because if you look at the New Revised Standard, it says suffering. Which sounds sort of like, well, we've heard it said. If someone's going through something horrible, we say, well, God's just testing you. Or this is part of God's plan. And the truth is, that word, suffering, tribulation, its truest sense really means nothing more than oppression. That's what's being said in that passage. Oppression. Now that changes things. I don't know if it does for you, but it certainly does for me. And this morning early when I was doing a word study that I should have left well enough alone, it changed the entire sermon this morning. So we'll see how well that goes. You see, it's not just about suffering. What I wanted to come and say this morning is we've got to stop thinking that somehow all the suffering in our life is redemptive. How do we get away with this when the Bible says this kind of thing repeatedly? And we know we've got folks who are suffering. But the truth is, the passage really is about people who are living under the thumb of oppression and don't have any other options. And so this passage is really talking then about saying, your suffering has meaning. Why is that important? Victor Frankl, some of you probably know his work, under the title, Man's Search for Meaning, he says this, despair is suffering without meaning. Meaningless suffering leads to despair. And so what Paul, I think, is doing here is to say, you do not suffer without meaning. Not that your suffering has meaning, but it has meaning beyond what the oppressors might tell you. Remain strong, remain faithful, because look what they did to Jesus. That you too can survive. Endurance, character. And hope and the character piece, which is really interesting, really is the Greek word proof. In other words, it's the story of having someone to look to who has been through the struggles. I don't want to pick on the, the, the folks who have been on the front lines in Ferguson who have come up with the idea, this, this message that says, this is not your mother's or your father's civil rights movement. Now, I know that they're taking shots at folks who said, oh, you're doing it all wrong. But the truth of the matter is we can't pick on the generations who have gone before us who have made it through because they've got a story to tell us. They've got wisdom. Those who have survived and those who have endured and those who have figured out how to live without living self-destructively and still made it out the other side have a story to tell us because we have not been there yet. It's like the old sage wisdom that got passed on to me that was told to one of our members, and she always tells me the story. The old woman would tell me, it's going to be all right. I don't know what all right looks like, but it's going to be all right. So I want to ask this morning if you've ever had trouble in your life. Now, the kind of trouble I'm talking about is not the kind of thing where you did it and you're paying for the consequences of your actions. The suffering that Paul talks about here is suffering that is brought in from the outside. It had nothing to do with us. It's the kind of suffering where you go, why me? The truth is, we live in a time where 
if anyone's suffering, somewhere along the line someone says there has to be meaning and it's probably their fault. If you're struggling and suffering, it just adds insult to injury. But at some point, we need to finally get honest with folks and say the truth of the matter is, on some level, in all of the world's religions, they've always said life is going to be about suffering. No one of us is going to avoid suffering and struggle in our lives. And the more we try to ignore it, the more we try to avoid it, the more pain we'll face down the road. We try to teach even our kids these days to avoid trouble and pain at all costs. It's called helicopter parenting. Don't let your children do anything that might cause pain or trouble. Never let them fail and make sure everyone gets a big trophy for participating. Because on some level in life, we all know, if we're honest, sitting in this room, that we have probably grown more from our failures and the things that have crumbled before us because we've had to put our lives back together in new ways. There is something of meaning to be found in all of our struggles and all of our sufferings if we can stop and listen and understand. But the hard part is this. No one else has the right or the ability to tell us what it means for us. <laughs> suffering can be redemptive, but you better not ever tell anyone who's suffering that truth. Because only we can give witness to the times in our lives when suffering has produced something we never would have expected otherwise. In fact, I'm going to give you permission today. The next time someone comes along while you're in the midst of suffering and pain and says, God's had a plan for it all, you can smack him in Jesus' name for me. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I believe that to be true. But instead of using band-aids and bumper stickers to deal with our own discomfort when other people are suffering, we might just stand with them in their pain. <laughs> Or we might reflect in our own lives where we have found redemption in the midst of struggles. Where in your life have you felt like this dead, dried up tree? It might be today. But at some point in your life, this is, we have all been here. Where have you in your own life felt like you could not go on one more day, maybe not even one more hour? And yet somehow, without maybe even a plan, speech or someone to come along and help you, you made it. You are here. You made it through. Your presence here today might just be the testimony that God can indeed make a way out of no way. That's the story we get to tell of the places where we have fallen down and hurt. We can't tell people God has a plan for your life. You just need to figure it out. What we can do is give a witness. First of all, we ought to just leave with silence and presence. But if someone asks, you can share with them your story. That means we might have to reflect on it a little bit and say, where was God? Now, here's the other thing I will tell you. You might spend the rest of your life reflecting on something horrific that happened in your life and still not come up with any plan, understanding, or meaning. And guess what? That's all right. That's probably being the most honest that we can. But there are experiences in our lives which will help us grow and learn and then help others. It is often out of the broken places of our own lives that we're able to be a light to others. Something you struggled through is something someone else is now struggling and needs your story and your life. And so we can share our lives and our witnesses. Like I said before, there might be times in your lives when you struggled and you suffered and you made it through and you still haven't figured out what the meaning was behind it. But you are still here. That's good news. At least we're getting closer. So let me do what I'm talking about, which is stop talking up here and share a little bit more concrete. I'm going to show you my, one of my stories. I was always seen as a bad student. Mine was the kinds of parents would say, if you just bring home C's and you try to go hard, we're happy for you. In fact, in my kindergarten report card or the parent-teacher conferences that's now recorded, the words were recorded from that meeting. You can imagine what was said. 
these three words. Mark is slow. Now, this is not about pointing to myself. There is an end game here that I want to get to. And little of this reality actually changed by the time I got to seventh grade. My parents were told basically that I might not be smart enough to go to high school, probably need to talk about uh, trade school if I was going to have any future. And certainly not a private school I was then attending. But thankfully, I had parents who were at least willing, maybe out of some embarrassment, to fight on my behalf. Because frankly, by that point, I believed I was an idiot. I believed it. So they sent me to testing, which I thought would prove what my teachers had been saying all along. And I was asked early on where I thought I'd fit on this scale. Now, we all know the trouble with IQ tests and that sort of thing. They showed me where average was. They said, where are you? And I was well below average, of course. And it turns out, after all this time and money and energy, came back and the opposite was true. The opposite of what everyone had said was true, much to my surprise, and frankly, I'm not sure I really believed it at that point. To the shock of my teachers, who then had to figure out where they had failed as educators, and my parents, who were surprised too. But I want to tell you stories of three educators who made a difference along the way, who taught me that I didn't have to put up with the circumstances, that I could actually do something, and this is, what, this is why I want to share they made it clear that life was about struggle. So what? You've got to work. You just have to work hard. That's what they told me in loving, loving ways at first. Mm. I was not allowed to wallow in it. I was told that I had to work hard because of my limitations. The first person, and I'm going to give a witness to her, his name is Miss Schwartz. And she showed me early on that school wasn't some magic thing that you had to sit down and have strategies and plans and work for it, that there was concrete things that I could do in order to play the game of school. She refused to believe or to let me believe that I was stupid and expected me to do better, and I did. I even made it to college. And very early on, I met a professor by the name of Dr. Turner, who, by the way, found out years later is a Presbyterian elder. And she pulled me aside after I turned in an assignment that was an abysmal failure. And she told me that my trouble wasn't that I was stupid. My trouble was really this, that somewhere along the line, someone had told me I was stupid, and I acted like it. And that she, from this day forward, wasn't going to accept any work that wasn't up to my abilities. And I graduated. And then I went to seminary. And it had been a few years, and I turned in my first paper in the Old Testament, thinking I'd done a pretty okay job, having written one draft and turned it in. I'll let that sink in for, for those of you who've had to edit my work. <clears throat> Her name was Dr. O'Connor. She's an Old Testament scholar, has written a whole lot on Jeremiah about pain and suffering and where hope can be found in some of the most difficult places. So a really good uh, teacher to learn from. And of course, I get this paper back and I turned in some part work and I went to her and I poured my heart out about the struggles that I have sometimes when it comes to putting what's in here on paper. And she said, that's great. That just means you have to work harder than everybody else. And guess what? I have the same problem. And she was a published author. And she said, and I look forward to the work that you will provide. I share those struggles not to point to myself. It's hard not to give a witness and do some of that. But what I want to say is that each one of them taught me that each one of us has struggles in our life, that life is going to be about some struggles. Most of them, which we didn't ask for or do anything about. We can make them worse, but we can't necessarily do anything about them. Each one of us has struggles, and probably a fair share that we didn't ask for or have anything to do with. But Paul's words, like the words of my teachers, remind us that we are not alone. Your struggles might not have been in school. Your struggles might have been a myriad of other things. In life and in the journey of faith, there will be struggles. Things will not always go on. Now, I will tell you, that's one of the reasons why today I'm always looking for the kids who are left behind, left out, and left to the margins, because I know that we might just find some really smart folk there who have been decided as being troubled, or have ADHD, or need to be thrown out of the classroom because they just need to give up on them. 
the truth is we can't give up. And I know this sounds a lot like a motivational seminar, but I think this is what Paul is talking about. Mm -hmm. To those who are living in most of the horrific situations, living under the thumb of oppression, what he's saying is it's not going to go away in that time. Paul couldn't have imagined the kinds of ways in which people would begin to rise up. So he gave them the best tools that he knew how. The truth is we can give up. We have the option of falling into despair. Or we can pick ourselves up, look for those who will help pick us up, and find a way because in the end God has not given up on us, no matter where we are in our lives today. Like those teachers in my own life, like teachers and other folks in your own lives, God sees our potential for growth even in later life. Why do I share that? You might remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. They were in their 80s when they started their journey to build a new nation. So following God can happen at any point in our lives. Living in new ways can happen at any point in our lives. So no matter where we find ourselves today, there is another day dawning, calling us to say that the death we find in this life today is not the end of the story. Don't give up on yourselves. Don't give up on others. Because in your brokenness and in your healing, you might be the light that other folks need to heal. God has not given up on us yet. And the good news is God never did.